Hey, hello, hi, welcome to and are back to the Equi Theory Podcast. I am your host, Jill Treese, and one of these days, I'm going to figure out how to segue into the rest of the content without saying, and in this week's episode, <laughs> we are going to be discussing some things that are going on in my life, and then some things that I hope that I'll be able to help you guys with what is going on in your life. Was that a coherent sentence? Maybe, maybe not, but you chose to listen to this podcast, so what does that say about you? <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's get into it. You know, we got all the cool theme music, and if you don't have headphones in, you're really, really missing out, because every time I'm editing this and I go through the theme music, I always listen to it, like every single time. I will not listen to the episodes back, but I will listen to the theme music, <laughs> because it low-key goes kind of hard in headphones, okay? So take my word for it and listen. And before we get into the actual content, you guys know we got to run the ads. I'm sorry. It's just, it's the way it is. I hope that you guys choose to support in one way or another, but listening is more than enough. Hi friends. If you've been wanting to learn even more about training, boy, oh boy, do I have the course for you. Getting Behavior, the Foundations of Animal Training, taught by Carolina Westland of Illis Animal Behavior Consulting, is an awesome online course that I actually had the pleasure of taking. Having already taken Carolina's amazing animal emotions course, I knew I was in for a whole lot of learning yet again. And even as an experienced trainer, I still learned a lot of entirely new things and gained a fresh new perspective and a more sciencey perspective on old things. It really felt like I was able to bolster my basics and get more confident in what I already knew. And also having a plethora of ways to explain the same thing is always helpful for different human learners. Successful animal training will help improve your relationship with your animal, reduce fear and stress, and empower the animal to take an active part in their own care and work with you. Plus, it's really fun. The Getting Behavior course is an online course of about 13 hours, that's 10 modules, a whole lot of learning, and as a bonus, you get monthly Q&A live webinars with Carolina where she answers all training-related questions. Find out more and also get $100 off the full price by following my link in the show notes. I also get a kickback from that, so I would really appreciate it, and also if you don't use it, then you don't get $100 off, so you better use that link, okay? Thanks. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Equitheory Patreon. By becoming a patron at one of the three tiers, you automatically become an Equitheorist. As one holding this holy title, you may simply monetarily support all things Equitheory content creation as every little bit counts and it goes a long way toward making the show better and science-based training and management education more accessible. Or alternatively, you have my permission to reap the sweet benefits to which you now have access. Those decadent benefits include supporting the show, Jill and the Horses. That's me. It's third person, first and foremost, of course. But also discounts in the Equithery store, Patreon exclusive swag, which is a fun word that they use, which is a mug and a sticker, but you know, your questions dubbed as those with the highest priority for podcastual response and access to the members only Discord server where you'll be able to join a community of like-minded equestrians, vote on topics for upcoming episodes, share your triumphs, get advice when you get stuck, and access to all of the beautiful sciencey minds of other trainers. Best of all, you get to join in live monthly meetings. During these meetings, you can ask as many of your training and behavior questions as your heart desires, plus get access to custom curated resources and meet fellow like-minded equestrians who are more than happy to talk horses for hours on end. Seriously. They go for like four hours. It's absurd. But beyond all of that, you also now have access to my eternal gratitude. <laughs> and if you aren't into the whole monthly subscription thing, you can choose to opt for the discounted annual subscription, or you can join for a month, cancel after it. You'll have lifetime access to the Discord server at the Echo Theorist Light tier, or you can just keep listening to the podcast. I sincerely appreciate it. I make a little bit of Corey that way, so like just keep doing it. Okay, that works for me. Thanks. But for serious, if you're interested in joining, you can just click on the link down in the description or go to patreon.com and type in Echo Theory and become a member today. Okay, so now that we have all of the boring stuff out of the way, let's get in, let's get into it. So um, basically, over the past couple of days, I have been not doing a whole lot of things <laughs> because number one, it's real feel like 108 to 111 here constantly I think next week is supposed to be better but it is impossible to want to go do anything outside in the sun because I feel like I am going to die and so uh yeah it's I've been 
not doing a whole lot because of that reason, but also I've got some some personal life things happening that maybe I'll talk about at some point, but at the moment, uh, sorry, I'm just going to um, tease you with that information <laughs> and just know that there is a, a little bit of a reason for uh, maybe this uh uh not a whole lot of super like happy go lucky content but also like um it's it's hard to be an equestrian content creator when you're like not doing anything horse related so that is why on this week's episode of the podcast i will be answering your questions about your horses since you guys are more productive than i am in that way um i just it's just too hot and none of the horses feel like doing anything i don't feel like doing anything everybody's just hot and sweaty all the time and it's, it's not fun. <laughs> so, and, uh, as hard as I tried to go to bed before midnight, it has just not, not been possible for me lately. So, um, you know, it, it be what it be. And, um, one of these days I'll, I'll get back to getting up at 6am and rocking out, but I just have not had the energy lately. It's very hard. <laughs> and part of it is probably, trying to do the whole gluten-free dairy free thing for my skin because my eczema has gotten out of control um for the skin nerds out there it's atopic dermatitis if you if you're feeling like googling I've got patches everywhere but um that and my hormonal acne so trying to decrease inflammation and sometimes that means I just forget to eat all day long because I'm also medicated for ADHD and um not it doesn't feel good. I do not recommend, uh, not the medication. I mean, like forgetting to eat It's it's the worst. And, um, also spending my money on things that I cannot (laughs) consume (laughs) and turn into energy. I, uh, it's just, it's so hard. I swear. I like me and my boss talk about it all the time. Like if I could just take a, a pill that had all of my dietary and energy requirements met, I would so do that because uh, sitting down and eating a meal is just uh, where where's the time (laughs) I live in America I uh, oh that was my dryer my clothes are done um I I live in America you know I I, I'm meant to be productive all the time as the great Andrew Tate says there is no ROI on cooking (laughs) so I'm totally joking by the way but I just it's it's so hard to find time in the day for anything more than uh like 15 granola bars and cereal. Um but that is that is one of my goals for the rest of the year is to to make a serious effort to actually take time to like make food for myself because I'm worth it. I don't have to just eat cookies and granola bars all day long. <laughs> and uh yeah, so uh, that's that's where we're at. So it's it's also like that it's hard to want to go work with the horses when I have zero energy, and uh, it's like I said, it's my own fault, and I gotta I gotta work on it. But um, yeah, d- it, yesterday we did actually have a rather rather nice day, and like I said, kind of kind of going through it lately <laughs> in the emotional department. So I was like. I just, I called my boss and I was like, what are you doing? (laughs) And she was like, I am sitting at home, not doing anything. And I was like, what if you came out and hung out with me though? I need a task. (laughs) Please give me a job. And she was like, okay, fine. Uh, We'll find something to do, I'm sure. And so she came out and uh, out purely out of pity, (laughs) which I sincerely appreciate. And uh, we we did some stuff around the farm. And then uh, I was like, you know, we really need to start like, actually working with uh Dexter and Azula. And if you guys aren't like super deep into the Echo Theory lure, uh not lure, like a fishing lure, like lore, L O R E. Um Azula is my 2-year-old filly and Dexter is a 2-year-old uh Irish sport horse, which is an Irish draught crossed with a thoroughbred. And, uh, his, his daddy is Cap Irish Charmer and his, uh, uh, dire, damn, <laughs> damn sire is dire. Um, his mother will say is, uh, thoroughbred by the name of Dixie Tripp. I, f- I think she went to, um, 
I think she actually is might be at the farm where Cap Irish Charmer is now. I can't remember. We we rehomed a lot of horses. <laughs> she either went there or to a therapeutic riding center. I cannot remember. I'm pretty sure she's in a, a breeding program, but um I could be wrong. Anyway, so um the both of them, like, unfortunately I am not the uh influencer who is like yeah, I'm going to lunge my two year old <laughs> and see how much tack I can put on it. No tea, no shade. But like, um, I, I just, I truly feel like a bad two year old owner because Azula, she'll let me halter her. And I think she'll let Sunny halter her, but anybody else is a little bit questionable because you do have to fully ask for permission, which you would think is not asking a whole lot, but, um, a lot of the, the people that, halter horses just assume that you can walk up to them and just shove this thing on their face and Azula's like no I need to know that you're going to be respectful when you have control of my face which is anthropomorphic of me to say but uh nonetheless I I just hold the halter out and she sticks her nose in it once and then she pulls it out and then I wait and then she sticks her nose in again and the second time I can put it on and buckle it I don't know why it has become that way somewhere in there that's how I accidentally <laughs> uh, taught that but uh, you know, you're, as as I said on the episodes with Adele Shaw, it is your own horses are just never going to be the best behaved client horses. We go all out. We make sure everything is beautiful and perfect. And with my own horses, there are just so many problems. Um, and they're not like real problems. It's just like it would probably be best if Azula knew how to like just be directly haltered. But also I'm kind of like, I don't hate that she she wants to. It's like a little testing the water. You know, I don't hate that for her, but other people probably need need to be able to catch her if, God forbid, I am not here uh, for some reason. Um, But yeah, so anyway, uh, I I just, I feel like when I look at other people online that have young horses, they're like working on so many things. And not that I agree with like putting tack on them or lunging them or like, like there's absolutely no reason to do that with a two-year-old or younger um, and with the, the age of their backs fully being fully developed, uh, being six is a little bit like you cost so much time and like, let's get really good at the basics first. And I realize that's a little bit hypocritical <laughs> because my filly is not so good at the basics. She'll pick up all four feet for me and the farrier, the holding it up for longer than, 30 seconds is a little bit questionable. Uh, I mean, but 30 seconds for a young horse is a long time. Honestly, like one, two, three, like that's a long time to get to 30. Um, and she, she has her feet done. She lets me deworm her sometimes and, um, halter lead all of that. Great fun. Wonderful. Um, but it's like, okay, honestly, it's not fair because all the other babies on the property, like don't have issues with this stuff like Astro, Dexter, Simba, and uh, Rory. All you could just walk up to them and stick the wormer in their mouth. Like when we dewormed um, Dexter and Simba, they were both laying down and just we walked up to them and just you know poked it in the corner of their mouth and gave it to them and they didn't even get up. And Azula, if she sees that tube, she's like, "Peace out, no thanks." And so I bought some applesauce, right? You know, to like put in a, a little tube and start working there but I have to get her to well I have to see if she likes the applesauce first um I don't know if it's one of those things that she'll come around on but at the moment she was like I this is not edible actually I can't so um gonna have to have to do that first and then hopefully maybe it'll be something that she likes and then I can use that to um make the deworming process you know a little bit better but um yeah, <laughs> the boys are just so easy. They're just like dur, 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 all the time. And Azula is like, she's too smart and sensitive. And so it's like, I have to do everything right, which is nice because I don't really enjoy the dur, dur, dur horses that much. I, I Have you guys seen anything of Zoe? Like <laughs> I enjoy the, the quote unquote problem horses or the sensitive ones that like actually require me to use my brain a little bit. And I will say though, I am becoming more and more appreciative of having a horse that is like semi not that way because, um, Azula, it's weird because she is somewhat more sensible than Zoe is like Sunny and I, my boss were talking about this last night that, um, 
she's really come such a long way from being like terrified of a lead rope. Uh, cause one time, uh, I put a halter and a lead rope on her and was leading her into a, a training area to separate her from the other horses. And, uh, my other darling girl, Zoe came up and just absolutely told Azula to get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> and Azula took off and the lead rope was, uh, you know, like dragging the ground because I couldn't unclip it. And, uh, she took off and went through the fence in three different places. <laughs> so, like, uh, not always the most sensible. And like with other, like with me, I could walk up to her and touch her anywhere and, uh, you know, rub her face, mess with her ears, her eyes. But if anybody else attempted to touch her face, she would recoil and was like, no, thank you. Absolutely not. And so while that made me feel very special, like I have my own very my very own black stallion moment. Uh, it's not great for the horse, uh, in the long run. And, um, you know, it, it is nice to see her like walking up to other people and not just me and investigating them and like getting pets from them and having good experiences. Uh, because I don't need her to be suspicious of new people. I need her to be like open and interested in new people. And so, yeah, it's, it's been really cool to see that development happen and her just like, it's really been over the last couple of months. Like she was always so skittish and so suspicious and distrustful. And now she's really come into herself and is so much more confident and curious and like working through the, the desensitizing the water hose. And, uh, which was like, after she realized what was happening and how much better it felt, um, you know, I worked through it with, uh, positive reinforcement and some systematic desensitization. Uh, after after doing that process, there was a, a shift in the middle of it, and I talked about it in an episode recently, like the whole process of me doing this. But um, after uh, we got past a certain point, then she was like, oh, I actually don't care about the food anymore. I just need you to spray me off. And now she spends like a majority of her day in front of the sprinkler. And um, we've cleared out some areas in the field that she's in now so she can get into that pond. Uh, I don't think they've been brave enough to test it out yet because it is much larger than the one where she originally was. But um, hopefully she'll be able to brave it soon. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's just cool to see her like really become more confident and less like spooky and afraid of everything. And like she's having so many experiences where she's learning like new people aren't so bad and new things that aren't so bad. And like, not everything is scary or going to hurt her because there, there have been so few of those experiences that we're really, really getting somewhere. And so, um, uh, Dexter on the other hand, uh, has not been my priority because like I said, he's so easy. So he, he halters really well and he leads and, like I said, you can deworm him, we get his feet done, and that's about the extent of both of their education. And Sonny and I have been talking about, like, like once we got the fence up around the arena, and now we've got the babies in the field where we can just, like, open the gate and take them directly into the arena instead of, like, having to lead them through other fields or in, like, big open areas, um, you know, just, just so we can, like, train them safely and not have to, like, Cause like leading them from one end of the farm to the other, to the arena is not ideal. Um, we needed to be able to work on that in a controlled environment before, you know, being able to lead them across the farm. And when I did have to lead Azula across the farm to move her into this field, she did so great. And so, um, that was really encouraging. And like that, it just, I don't, I don't know why I'm like super rambling about this, but I hope it's like <laughs> interesting somewhat, but, um, like, there, when, when I did have to lead her, there were so many like things that kept popping up and spooking her. And I think I talked about it recently, but she just like was so cool to like come back to me and use me as like a safe reference point. And, uh, like I could just, I don't know. It it just seemed demonstrably like the, the trust was there and she was really like confident in me and like, okay, well, I mean, if you're cool, then I'm cool. And, that's really, really a good feeling. And so anyway, we decided yesterday that since it was a little bit overcast finally, and wasn't a million degrees that we would take the horses into the arena 
And so we just opened the gate and let them come in at Liberty. We had halters and I had my treat pouch on. And so we were just like, let's see, let's see what happens. And, um, we brought them in and they were more concerned (laughs) with, uh, the alfalfa pellets that I had on me than they were with the, um, you know, arena exploration for the first little bit of it. And, uh, so we just let them, let them walk around. And I tried to like separate myself a little bit from them so that they would explore some more. And it was, it was just a really cool experience because every time that they like got a little bit nervous about something, they would just come back over to us and we're like, wait, are you guys okay? Like it felt like, like I, I understand that horses do not recognize people as a part of the herd per se. Um, but to still be a safe companion, you know, that they were like, okay, we're, we're all a group, you know, um, not a herd. I'm not a horse. And I don't think that my horse sees me as a horse, but, um, still as a, a point of safety, something to be trusted. Um, and it, it was just really cool. So yeah, we, we had them, uh, you know, stepping over some poles on the ground and just like sniffing them, exploring the standards. And at one point I walked over a pole, uh, like two poles side by side on the ground and, I walked over it and Azula followed me and she like did a little jump over it. And I was like, oh my God, are you going to be a jumper? That'd be so cute. And uh, Dexter did the same thing. And like, okay, I want to be very clear. Don't jump two-year-olds. Not advocating for jumping two-year-olds. Absolutely not. Uh, Them choosing to jump over a a pole flat on the ground is a little bit different than um, actually jumping two-year-olds. I have seen them do far more dangerous uh, potentially self-injurious behaviors out in the field. So I'm not, uh, I am a very strong advocate for waiting until horses are mature to ask them to do anything, even put a saddle on them. I'm like, let's not do that with two-year-olds. There's literally no point. And, uh, you know, like, I don't, I don't know that I need how clear I need to be on this, but I do not think it's good to jump young horses. I have, uh, Zoe who I started, uh, she, she got broke to ride when she was a yearling and then she was a racehorse until she was three. And I started eventing her when she was a three-year-old and now she has kissing spine, arthritic hocks, and God knows what else. I am kind of not super keen to explore (laughs) what else might be there. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't advocate for it. I I am personally dealing with the repercussions of doing so. So, um, but say that said, I'm not mad at seeing my little Philly Billy do a little, a little yeehaw over a bush. And I actually have this uh, video on my YouTube. I'll put it, I'll link to it in the show notes. And if you go to the, the episode webpage on equitheory.com, you can watch the video there. Um, that, of her like as god I don't even know how old she was I think she was like eight or nine months because it was when we were doing a gradual weaning process um of her jumping over a, a, a bush and she looked so cute like her form was so good she hit that stride it was nice she found the spot amazing so uh she might be a little a little jumper in the day but um all that to say I'm justifying <laughs> that she jumped over a pole that's literally three inches on the ground um but it was very cute and made me excited to see, you know, in the future when she is mature enough to do things like that with her. And also just like the bravery, um, because after she jumped it, there was no more jumping. She was like, I can walk over this. Actually, there's no effort needed. And, you know, that's that's what I always uh, was told growing up that uh, over jumping is not a flex. It is usually indicative of an insecure horse or a horse that is not, um, super, uh, what's it? sure, sure of the jump, sure of their form. Uh, because most horses that are very experienced jumpers know how high they need to jump and how much energy to exert so as not to hurt themselves or whatever. So over jumping is not a good thing. It's not a flex. <laughs> it's, uh, I either either it's a sign of the insecurity or of inappropriate tax such as pinch boots and things like that. Um, so all that to say that uh, we had a really good time with Azula and Dexter. They explored and then um, I got to like see the arena and be in it and they they got some zoomies out and then when they 
uh, started hanging out by the gate, we were like, okay, I guess that's it. And so we let them out. It probably lasted all of, you know, 15 maybe minutes. And most of it was them walking around and like just looking at stuff. And I was like, oh my God, the most sensible two-year-olds in the world that are just like exploring (laughs) and not, uh, not tearing around like the adult horses. They accidentally got into the arena once because there's a door to the main arena that, um, that's sticky. And if you don't close it just right, it's very easy to come open. And so that all of the horses went through the people door and, uh, they all tore around like bats out of hell. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. So, um, to see the two, two year olds just being like super mature and like curious, methodically moving was like very, very good. So yeah. And after, after we got done, we let him out and the guy that does a lot of the mowing out here, cleared a cleared a few spots and was mowing the other side of their field because I don't know how much sense this is going to make without a visual but um in Azula's field there's the big front area and the arena's in it and then there's a big pond and behind the pond is a little path that lets out into this other little field area and it's the grass has been really high and I don't think the babies were ever brave enough to like go across the uh the little bridge back there and uh Sonny and I wanted to see what had been done. So we walked down by the pond where it had been cleared and showed the horses like the little entryway into the pond and then walked around the bridge. And we're just like walking with the with the two two year olds. Sonny was in front and then the two two year olds were behind her. And then I was in the back and I got a video of it that I'll also throw on the uh, website page that you guys can watch. And uh, it was just so peaceful to just be walking behind them and having our little our little trail ride almost, but not ride, just a trail walk, like just hiking with horses casually. And uh, then they led out into the other field and they both were just like exploring and blowing and trotting around and looking at us and then coming with us. And I went down to the other area where it lets into the pond and they both came with me. And so, I mean, it was just, it was just a cool experience to just be walking around with them. And I said to Sunny, like, um, why, why do we ride again? Cause this is so much fun and it's, it's like nothing. It's literally nothing is happening. We're just walking with them. It's so boring, but also so peaceful and nice. And just to have that connection of like, they're interested enough and want to be with us enough that they are, uh, you know, choosing to come along and enjoying the investigation as much as we are, you know, we're on an expedition. It's like a Winnie the Pooh episode. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then, uh, Azula decided it was time to return to the sprinkler and they both took off and, uh, hauled ass across the field and then ended up under the sprinkler and it was very cool. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was our little experience the other day, a little excursion. And it was just so nice to, to just not have any expectations and just be experiencing them, experiencing things and exploring and, just developing a little bit more of that trust. Cause I really think that is what has gone the longest way with, um, with Azula, because like I said, she was so suspicious and not, not trusting of me or of other people for so long. And I think the thing that has made the biggest difference with her is just spending time with her and being around her and proving time and 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 time again, that I am to be trusted, I have her best interests in mind, and the things that I do are not to hurt her, they are to help her. And um, they're usually pleasurable, enjoyable. She gets lots of scratchies and lots of snacks, and uh, it's just a good time. (laughs) I'm a good time. And uh, it's so funny, I've been binging F Boy Island on HBO Max, and I feel like I am, (laughs) I feel like I'm giving my nice guy speech that I am a I, I'm a nice guy and I'm proving it time and time again. So, um, I'm not an F boy like the rest of horse professionals as far as Azula is concerned. <laughs> so anyway, just, just a very like wholesome moment, good time. And I highly recommend it if you can with your horse. Uh, obviously not everyone has the space and the access to be able to do it at Liberty, but it is really cool to not not have a halter on and just have them coming with you because they're like, yeah, let's go where you're going. That sounds good. Uh, but yeah, so 
that's my little little experience that I wanted to share. And now I think we can move into a new segment that I'd like to do in, you know, maybe every episode, maybe just some episodes of the show where I answer your advice segments. I told you in the beginning of the episode, we're going to be talking about some things about me and then some things about you. So uh, this is the some things about you part. So uh, to, to let me lay this out first so that we all are on the same page. So a while back, I always did episodes that fell under the like Q&A category. And uh, I think there's like a whole playlist of them either on my website or on YouTube where you can listen to all of the, the questions that I got through emails or through Patreon and that I would answer on the show. And uh, so what I've decided to do is if you are a, a member of the Patreon, you can, there's a special form where you can ask your question, you can submit it to me, and there's a high likelihood that I'll answer it on the show. Because like I said, a lot of the time, I don't have a whole lot going on. So maybe I will just answer questions. If I do have a whole lot going on, or we have a guest that week, I probably am not gonna do the questions. But, um, you know, I do, I do think that that is kind of like the bread and butter of this podcast. And it's always been kind of a balancing act to figure out how I can like still have an interesting podcast that's not just a Q and A constantly, but also um, still talk about training and discuss these things and uh, keep the podcast interesting. So hopefully, um, you guys will find that in these upcoming upcoming episodes and have little little segments. So maybe it will be a consistent part of the episode. Uh, you know, a lot of podcasts I watch, like I watched Unhinged with Chris Clemens and he has like Chris's court <laughs> and I don't have a, a catchy name, but uh, training and advice is what we're this little segment here. And if anyone is capable of making a jingle, hit me up and I will play that jingle um, for our training and advice and behavior sessions. Woo. Um, but yeah, I, if that, if that works for you guys, I can just do that every time. But anyway, so I have a, where on Patreon where you can submit your questions. The word count is longer than it is if you're not a patron. Um, just because I, I, nobody wants to hear me read forever. Um, and, uh, yeah, also it's, f- it's basically free training and advice. So if you want like actual specific advice, you can become a patron, but there's also a form that will be linked down below for free, um, where you can just submit with uh, as much characters as you could fit into a tweet on Twitter. And, uh, I will not read it. If you write multiple submissions that are like continuing the same question, they have to be different questions. Um, that's why the word count is there, my guy. But, um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that makes sense. It's all linked down below. So if you're interested and you want me to answer a question on the show, I might. There's a high likelihood that I will. But if you're a Patreon, there's an even higher likelihood. So with that said, we are going to kick it off starting with a patron question. So uh, let me let me read that to you. Okay. Are you ready for a little a little story time, a little a little reading session, fireside chat, if you will? It reads, I have a new pony. I got her a few weeks ago who is extremely hesitant to lead. She walks a few steps and refuses to move. She's in an isolation paddock as she's new to the yard, but it won't be long. uh, And she currently has no company. So it might be part of the cause. Uh, There are loads of other horses on the yard. She can see them, just no nose to nose contact. I have had to use negative reinforcement to get her to continue walking. Uh, and by negative reinforcement, they mean pulling on the lead rope until she walks forward and then releasing as well as using or as walking with a whip and waving it to encourage her to walk forward. Uh, I hate it, but it's the only thing that works at times and cars try to get past, which makes it more stressful and urgent. How would you encourage her to walk forward in hand with the use of positive reinforcement? So this is a great question because um, I think when a lot of people come from the traditional world, it can be hard to like learn how to see things differently. And so a lot of times you're like, I need the horse to move and the horse is not moving. So like, what do I do? Um, and so being in an isolation paddock would be a great opportunity to work on this issue because you don't have a lot of other horses swarming around you. And with, with a particular issue like this, a lot of times if there are other horses in a herd, you need to take the horse that you need to work with away from those horses. And that requires leading them. (laughs) So then you're kind of like, you can't, it's hard to work on that problem when it's, yeah. I mean, it's still possible and not difficult, but 
I, I'm trying to be encouraging in the way that this is an ideal setup to work on this issue. So if if possible, like I, I'm not sure what the setup of this barn is because there's no like I don't know wh- why you need to leave the paddock. Like, are you going for lessons? Um, where where's the horse going? It, do you have to cross a road? Uh, with the car situation so that makes it a little bit confusing um, and like hard to answer because um, balking b-a-l-k-i-n-g and like not wanting to move forward is usually a a sign of either something that you're walking away from they would like to be with or something that you're walking to is not something that they want to go towards so if you're say walking towards a a barn that the horse is afraid of. They might not want to go towards that barn because they're scared. Or if you're walking towards a barn because that's where you go get tacked up and then you ride and have a lesson and the horse has to work super hard and doesn't enjoy the work that they're doing, they might not want to head towards that barn. Um, or like not in the case of this horse, but if, if they're in a paddock with all their buddies and they're, and maybe they just got their alfalfa put out, they're probably not going to want to leave right now, you know? And so a lot of horses you'll find different, um, different motivations for leaving and staying and coming and going and all of that. So, um, I, I would say to identify that at the moment, um, because like why consider why does the horse not want to go forward what is on the other side of that walk that the horse is trying to avoid and if you have to cross a road it could be the road the road could be very scary um and if you have to uh go have a lesson maybe take a break from lessons for a little bit until you work on this issue or do something that the horse might enjoy more on the back side of it like after the walk you know they get uh a bucket of their grain or they get to like hang out and explore for a little bit. You know, there, there are, there's a myriad of things that could be reinforcing to a horse on the other side of a walk. So first thing I would consider is why, why does the horse not want to go forward and how could I make the other side of the walk better? Second thing I would consider is the actual training, the walking, uh, walking in hand, better. So you can work on this in the horse's paddock and, um, it's, it's very simple. Uh, I would just do target training. So right now in this position, you are pulling on the lead rope and when the horse takes a step forward, you're releasing that's negative reinforcement. And the horse knows that if they stop, then the pressure from the lead rope will be applied. And then when they take a step forward, that the pressure will go away. That is how good negative reinforcement works. Um, the waving the whip to encourage walking forward is a little bit of escalating pressure. So, um, and arguably it's positive punishment because it is a, a, a threat that like, if you do not walk forward, I will whip you. Um, whether you will or not, that's the reason it's working because the horse presumably has a past history of being whipped. Otherwise the horse would not know why to be afraid of the whip. It's not an innate thing. It has to be learned. So, um, waving the whip, the horse is like, eh, if I don't take a step, I'm going to get hit. Um, so whether you're, you're doing it or not, again, it is still a threat and is argu- arguably positive punishment for not walking forward and you're punishing the stopping behavior. So what I would do instead, instead of the punishment and the, um, applying pressure, I would instead make walking forward more rewarding in a a desirable way and in an appetitive way for the horse because right now walking is motivated by getting away from things getting away from the pressure of the lead rope and getting away from the whip waving so in the field with her alone you can start in protected contact which is how i always recommend starting and um it, you know run through the basics of working on manners and working on Uh, the touch targeting. And then I really recommend that after you have a horse consistently touching a target, make sure that behavior is really, 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 really solid and use a word with it. Um, So saying touch, like touch is my cue for, I don't need you to move your feet. I just need you to touch this object with your nose. And then target is my cue for um, follow with your feet. Don't worry about touching it with your nose. Because like I said, in the last episode with Adele, I accidentally like conflated the two because I got excited with Zoe and if if you've ever 
if you're new to clicker training or you've been clicker training for a while, you know that at the beginning, it's very, very hard not to move super, super quickly. So like with Zoe, when I first started target training, I would hold out an object and have her touch it. And I'd click and tree and click and tree and click and tree. And once, once she was doing it consistently, then I started just changing it so so drastically like I'd hold it super high and then super low and then super left and super right and like moving it all around in all of these different places after she just learned how to touch it and which can be fine for some horses but that can also be way too much and very frustrating for others and you need to maybe go a little slower break it up into different sessions Um, and then I kind of conflated that with okay now follow it and then waited on her to touch it um, before clicking and treating so what I would recommend doing The easiest way to keep it like super simple and clear to the horse is um, to present a a target and teach the word touch. And then in your next movement, you know, when you start moving into training the follow behavior, I would hold out an object and say target. And if it's the same object that you're using for the touch training, you click when the horse takes a step towards it. Okay. Do not wait on the horse to touch the object when you're training target because you're training follow. You want to reinforce the horse for walking in the direction and paying attention to the target. If you wait for the horse to touch the target, you're reinforcing that touch behavior. So when you start asking them to follow the target, they'll start getting quicker and quicker and quicker and get frustrated that you're moving the target away from them because they don't understand that the goal, the behavior that you're looking for is the walking following the target. The goal is not to touch it. It's just to follow behind it. I hope that distinction makes sense. So really delineate the two and say target and then click them for just leaning in the direction of it or taking a step towards it, but not the touching it. You can reinforce the touching it after you say touch and then hold out the object and then they touch that. And then when you say target and hold out the object, they walk towards it and you click before they touch it. Hope that makes sense. So um, start with this over a fence just because sometimes it can, when a horse is new to clicker training, it can be a lot at the beginning and it keeps them safe from you and it keeps you safe from them. Uh, and like, especially a horse like this, that you you guys are in a new relationship and the horse is aware of the, you know, the capability of humans to not be so good. And uh, well, t- not necessarily to not be so good, but more so that like, people can carry whips and stuff. So sometimes, even if you're not a bad person, (laughs) even if you're not a bad person, that's a silly thing to say, but like, uh, even if you are not a bad person to the horse and that you haven't hit them before or anything like that, um, and that you, you want to work on this relationship, it's possible that the horses have had bad experiences with people before. And a lot of times they feel safer in protected contact and are more willing to try new things. So, um, it, for a lot of horses, you come out of protected contact super quickly and it's not a big deal, but for others, it can take a little bit more time. So it just depends on you and your horse. And, uh, when you're new to clicker training, it also keeps you safe from horses that aren't aware of food manners yet. So like I said, teach food manners first. Um, and I have several episodes on that. There's a beginner's guide to positive reinforcement training. That is a four part series that goes over like everything. And I also have some videos on YouTube about it and information on my website that I'll, I'll put in the show notes down below. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I would teach that make sure the horse is confident with it and then start teaching the following the target behavior over the fence. And then, at this point, you might be able to move into or into out of protected contact and have the horse um, following the target. Uh, I like to keep them in a low head position so it's it's more relaxed and calm. And then, uh, you know, from there, you can move into just teaching them how to take more steps and follow you. Do not increase the criteria super fast. Remember, I recommended starting with just leaning towards the target. And then when you say target, hold it out and then you get one step and then you get one step again and then you get one step again and then you get one step again. And then once you're getting that consistently, move up to two steps. And then when you get to three or four steps, you might use a keep going signal in the middle. And I'll link to down below to an article about a keep going signal. But basically, it's just that you... Um, it, <sighs> It's it's hard to verbalize, and the article is very good, so I recommend using the article. But basically, it's a word or a sound, something that indicates the animal you're on the right track. 
I just need you to do it for longer. So it trains duration in a way and it encourages the animal to keep going. It's, I believe, a tertiary reinforcer. I'm a little rusty on, my, on all of the science, but um, I believe it's a tertiary or third level reinforcer that the horse knows that, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm about to get the, you know, the secondary reinforcer, which would be the click and then the primary reinforcer, which is the food. Um, so you, let me, let me run it out here. So you say target and you hold out your target stick or your object or whatever, the horse starts walking towards it and they take one step, two step, three steps, and you say, good. And they take four steps, five steps, and then you click and treat. Still, while the horse is walking, because that's the behavior we're reinforcing for targeting, correct? Okay. And so, yeah, it's, 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 it's very easy to train. It's very straightforward. It's one of the things that I start training and, um, it can be, it's one of those things that is easy to mess up, but I think that I have learned from my mistakes and have covered it thoroughly in this, in this explanation to be like, okay, this is how you avoid making those mistakes where you have a horse that angrily follows the target. Um, because I've trained many a horse since and, uh, have not run into that issue. It's just been a matter of, um, you know, <laughs> actually working with uh, other people's horses and having so much more luck with that than with my own. But, uh, yeah, like I said, my own are the guinea pigs. So, uh, that, that is how I would work on the encouraging to walk forward. And again, addressing like, why does the horse not want to go forward? And like you said, it might be something that resolves a little bit better when the horse isn't isolated anymore. You can also make the paddock more enriching by having things like nose it balls, like little, um, food dispensing balls or the hay balls. Uh, you can, there's a ton of different, uh, enrichment opportunities that you can give your horse. Uh, Pinterest is a good place to go. And there's a lot online, just Google enrichment for horses. Um, but yeah, so let's figure out wh why does the horse not want to go? Like what is, what's impeding progress? And, uh, if, if there's more, also you can become a patron and you can talk to me about it in meetings. Um, but yeah, okay. So moving on to the next question here, and this might be the last one that we have time for. Um, what do you do with a green horse who rears up just a little bit while asking to go forward more so in the trot than in the walk? So hearing, hearing this is, um, my very, very first inclination is the saddle because, um, there, uh, and you can, you can watch a lot of the live streams on my YouTube channel that I've done with Johan Schleza. And he talks about why, um, why this could happen and why rearing is common because often saddles have what we call a closed pin fit. So, uh, in the pommel area of the saddle, it is meant to just sit down on either side of the horse's spine on their withers. And there is a lot of nerves and really sensitive, uh, areas of the saddle there, but there's also, uh, non or muscles that are meant to be non weight bearing. They, um, so like on the horse's withers is their trapezius muscles. So if you know what your traps are, what your trapezius muscles are, it's at the base of your neck, what connects your neck to your shoulders, that little triangle area. And if you've ever had anybody like walk up behind you and grab that, it doesn't feel super great. <laughs> and on horses, it's what they call the handbrake. So if a stallion were attempting to breed a mare per se, that's where they would grab because it does provide some level of immobility of the front legs. And, uh, it, this also works on geldings as well. It's just a really uncomfortable place. It works on us as I mean, my traps are always ridiculously tight. Shout out anxiety. But um, <laughs> it, when the saddle sits down on that muscle, it really inhibits forward momentum. Um, but if that's not happening, it could also be that the saddle is impeding the shoulders in some way. The saddle or the shoulder moves back in a, a circular motion, kind of like a, I don't know what they call that. It's been a long time since I was in physics, but like a piston that moves in like a circle. Um, it kind of works like that. And so the shoulder can slide back uh, like around an average of four inches from where it is stationary. So you can set the saddle on, you can be like, yeah, there's plenty of shoulder clearance, but when the horse moves, the shoulder goes back a, you know, 
around four inches. So is your saddle still providing clearance there? Or is it hitting or is the shoulder hitting the saddle when the horse is trying to move? Because on the edge of that scapula is the is a bunch of cartilage. And once that cartilage is damaged, it does not come back. It is non-regenerative. It's it's gone. And you can start to have like calcification and all sorts of issues. So it's really, really important to have a saddle that fits. And to that end, also, it is with the mention of this being a green horse, um, it's it probably doesn't have a top line, a well-developed top line. It probably doesn't have a whole lot of great musculature. So, uh, or the horse has changed and it started out with the saddle fitting fine. And now all of a sudden we have this rearing issue because maybe the horse did develop more muscle and now the saddle doesn't fit because the horse's body's changing. Just like if you work out a lot, your body and your physique is going to change and it's going to change the way that your clothes fit. So maybe they get tighter. And so now you need to go up a size. And, uh, so it's, it's important to get that checked and fitted. Uh, and I would say that that's probably going to be the issue. Uh, I mean, and having a body worker out like a massage therapist, um, to assess like the level of soreness and where the soreness is will probably give you a really strong indication of how the saddle's fitting and having a, a really accredited saddle fitter check it out because just because you've had the saddle fitted or the saddle is custom does not necessarily mean that the saddle fits and is truly custom to the horse. I have had like serious big name brands look at my saddle and tell me that it fit when now knowing what I know about the research and the science behind saddle fit, it absolutely did not. And it is appalling that that happened because now I have a horse that has kissing spine, not blaming them. I should have done my research, but like very frustrating. So ask multiple different sources and body workers are probably going to be a really good source uh, because they'll be like the horse is sore here and they don't have a horse in the race. They're not trying to sell you a saddle, you know? So um, I would, I would have that assessed because if, if the horse is, is walking fine and then when you ask it to trot, it's like, I can't go forward. I've experienced this several times, like almost every time that I've had a horse that feels a little bit sticky up front or rears when I ask for the trot, it's the saddle and, uh, or they have a shoulder out in one way or another. And so just having the body work in combination with the tack fit, I mean, maybe you can ask somebody to take a look at your saddle or to ride in a different saddle, somebody else's and see if there's, if there's any difference, because it might just be that it doesn't fit the horse anymore, which is frustrating, but it is so, 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 so common and so, so, so important that that issue gets addressed. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope that is helpful. Um, I think I got time for one more here. So, uh, motivation for working with horses in the winter sessions. I can tend to feel like a bad owner when I get in these ruts and when I know I shouldn't. So first of all, I will say that as long as the horse is taken care of and has all of their basic needs met, you have no reason to feel bad. I know that that doesn't get rid of the bad feeling, but in my opinion, at least there is no reason to feel bad. The horses are not, um, they're not, you're not doing them a disservice by not working with them. If anything, uh, most horses are like, that's, that's great. Thank you. Please just let me be a horse. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe if you aren't already, maybe try clicker training and positive reinforcement. It's, it's fun. And it, it just tests a different side of your brain. You get to do different things and it's, it's cool to see the change in your horse, but, um, well, you know, I mean, it's the horses light up differently than they do when you're riding traditionally. And again, not a dig at traditional riding. It's just, it is visibly different when you're doing positive reinforcement successfully with a horse. It is, it's a world of difference. Um, so if you, if you're already doing that and you're still like, mm, cause I'm, I'm right there with you, <laughs> I'll say, I, I couldn't tell you the last time I like properly worked with Zoe uh, I gave her a bath the other day and she really enjoyed that. And beyond that, it's mostly just been scratches and hanging out with her. And the same for Azula. Like we did the thing yesterday, but uh, before that, I think I gave her a bath, which was cool. It was her first bath and I've never given her a bath. I've never used soap on her and I just did everything at Liberty and she was totally fine. I didn't have food or anything. She just was cool with it because of 
that reinforcement history. It's just very strong. And uh, she trusted it and was super cool. So, um, yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, try something new or work on something that you've been, uh, you've been curious about. Uh, or if, if you're just like not really into working with them and all of their needs are met, like, I mean, just, you can just go out and hang out with them and be with them. I really think that that has been the biggest game changer in my relationship with Azula versus Zoe. Zoe, like we always had a task when we were together and now it's less so, but she still has that like long history of having always been asked something. So with Azula, it's different because 90% of the time I'm interacting with Azula, I don't want anything from her. I'm not asking her to, you know, come into the barn or to go into the arena or to train this or to work with that or to stand for her feet still or get shots and dewormer. Like that's a very, very small percentage of the time that I spend with her. Most of it is just being with her, scratching her in the field, looking at what she's looking at, saying hi, talking to her. And like, it's just very low key relaxing. And I think it has really made our relationship that much better. And because she just doesn't expect me to expect anything of her. And then when I do, she's happy because it's, she's happy to participate because it's, it's a new, exciting thing. And there's no, like, you know, there's no really negative association there. So, um, you know, I would say that if you bottom line is that if your horse's needs are met, there is no shame in not even going to the barn, (laughs) you know, I mean, because the reality is if you are into horses, you are probably somewhat addicted to horses and you will always come back. But sometimes you just need a little bit of a break. So don't feel bad for not wanting to go out because it's, it's normal. It happens to everyone, especially if horses are your career. It's very, very hard. So I hope your case is not that if it is your career, then I wish you Godspeed. Try, try something new, something different. Um, find a way to reward yourself for doing it and appreciating it because it is very hard to do it as a job. But, um, you know, if, if it's not your job and it's just your casual hobby, let it be your casual hobby and just have, have fun and enjoy the horse. Your, your horse is not going to be upset if you're not riding them, you know, or if you're not lunging them every day or training them in some way. You can just go out and give them scratches and say hello and hang out with them. That is the way that horses spend most of their time and the way that they bond with each other the most is just grazing next to each other and grooming each other and being around each other. That Their love language is literally quality time. I mean, like, it doesn't get any better than that. So even if that's all you can bring yourself to do or all you really want to do, you are probably doing the best thing for your relationship with your horse. And that's not to say that training is not the best thing, but it's just different, you know, and it can be a a not so great thing for your relationship, or it could be a great thing and you could become a source of enrichment, you know, so you can, you can just change it up, keep it fresh or take a break and just keep it low key and easy for a little while until you feel like you're, ambition is back or you could listen to a bunch of horsey related podcasts that always seems to get me get me going um so yeah I hope that that was helpful that was three questions two of which were on the on the free side and they're much shorter so um let me guys let me know what you guys think about this little format here uh I have a feeling I'll be doing these pretty frequently uh just to just to keep the horsey topics around but um yeah, I don't know. I, I hope that I hope that it, it went well. And I'm not going to say I hope that you guys enjoyed the episode again. I'm not going to say that. Uh, and I think I think we're going to call it a day. So be sure to check out the, the forums if you want to submit your your own questions. I also have the listener survey down there if you want to tell me what we can do better on the podcast. And by we, I mean me. It's literally only me. But anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to rate and review the podcast if you like it. And I will catch you guys in the next episode next Tuesday. Bye.